please join us in France, episode 76. Hello, I'm Annie. And I'm Elise. And she's here today. Yay! How nice to see you, Elise. Nice to see you, Annie. And today we have a wonderful show for you that's very appropriate for this summer Exactly. You know, weather. So I'll let you introduce the subject, Elise. But first, you have to tell us what you've been up to. <sighs> you know, have you seen any good French movies? Have I seen it? No. No? <laughs> I go to the movies and watch American movies. <laughs> Isn't that awful? <laughs> no. what, um, what did I just see? I saw a French movie that was ridiculous. Hang on. It's right behind me. Let me go grab it. Tell us about the one you saw and I'll um, come right back. Well, actually, I saw a very charming movie that takes place in Paris, but the movie is American. And that was called My Old Lady, and it uh, is a movie with uh, Maggie Smith and Kevin Klein and Kristen Scott Thomas, and the whole thing is filmed in the Marais. Oh, well, that has something to do with France, then. Exactly, and yeah. uh, that's probably one of the reasons I wanted to go see it, aside from the fact that I wanted to see something that was just going to be kind of like a nice summer t- fairy tale type movie. <laughs> and uh, it's about, um, the story has to do with something that, I would, I don't know if I was talking to you about it, but it has to do with uh, somebody who is kind of a, a loser a little bit in life who comes from the United States, from New York, because he has inherited an enormous apartment in a magnificent old building in the Marais. Mm. Well, that's still a good he, problem to have. It's a good problem, except that he's come, <laughs> he comes to Paris because he wants to sell it because he needs money. Yeah. Because he doesn't know how to hang on to money. Yeah. And, uh, he discovers that there's a woman in it who is in there on the, uh, the, lo- the law of the viage. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, which of course does not exist in the United States. And so a lot of the movie is about explaining, of course, what that yeah, is. And Viagé then it turns out to be a romantic, comedy because he falls in love Not with, with the, old the lady. daughter oh, of the old lady okay, okay. and uh and in the end they all live happily ever after and stay in the apartment you know, oh so, how which, nice how if nice. you have a 250 square meter apartment in the marais with a back garden i yeah. don't think you could complain too much yeah i you know. think you can probably live <laughs> but it was actually kind of fun and so it really what, was, what's the name of the movie again my old lady my old lady yeah hmm, that sounds good it was really cute well i saw a french movie just last night it's called demander la permission aux enfants it's ask for the kids permission yeah it's a ridiculous movie it's not a very good movie but it's about these, uh, it's a very French movie. It's about these uh, two families, no, three families that have horribly demanding kids. And you know, in America these days, it's really popular to talk about how well raised and how well behaved French kids are. That's right. And, and it, there might be some truth to that in, you know, some extent, but I think it's grossly overplayed. You think it's overplayed? Well, I think it's overplayed. I mean, there are plenty of just, I, I was Not with very... a, I was with a family doing a walk around Toulouse last week, and they kept saying that to me. Look at how those children are so well behaved. Huh. Well, I'm not saying French kids are not well. Anyway, in this show, they are, they misbehave terribly, and it's about those three families trying to get back at the children. Hmm. Um, it, you know, I don't even know if it comes, I, I don't think my DVD came with English subtitle. I'll have to see if I can find it on Amazon and put a link there. But it's just a weird French movie. Very French. Kind of funny. Hmm. But but yeah, French kids... Parents uh, getting revenge on their children. Huh? I think French kids overall, um, they certainly learn a lot more stuff at school. That's true. Like French school is really, really demanding. Is it demanding in the right ways? Well... But that, I don't but, know. But I think when people make the comment about French children, they're not referring to what they learn at school. They're referring to their behavior in public. And I think that there is a lot of truth to the fact that uh, it, in general, obviously, there are exceptions and it's yeah. not everybody. But but parents teach their children how to behave in a restaurant. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they How to be patient with the long be meals. Patient. They, they teach them how to behave in public. And I really think that has to do with the fact that Children in France start being in a collective situation at the age of three. Yeah. And they do learn to cooperate. They learn because they go to the creche and then they go to preschool. And they really are taught to work together and to cooperate. Mm -hmm, Obviously, mm -hmm. there are children who have other kinds of personality issues. But I think that that really does make a difference. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's very cute when you see, especially now in June, when 
all the kids from the smallest to the oldest go on outings. Yes. And you see them walking around the city and you see them going to museums and they're so cute walking hand in hand. Yes. <laughs> they're just adorable. I love it. You know? <laughs> I saw some at the Augustown Museum last week and uh, they were about seven, eight years old and they, it's true. They were really well behaved. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. The teachers really know how to keep the kids in check and they don't let them fly off the handle. And No, but uh, there's got to be something. It's already relatively ingrained in them because I'm sure that teachers try to do that in the States too. Yeah. But there's a lot of difference in the way the kids behave. Right. Well, French life is very, I think, is very s- set. Ordinary. Uh, yeah, ordinary. Yes. So you, you get up at a specific time. You have your breakfast and your you breakfast. Your lunch at a specific right, time. Lunch at a specific time. You have a snack for the kids and then you have your dinner. But they, but the kids know what to expect. Right. And I think kids and dogs do really well if they have a schedule. Are you putting kids <laughs> and dogs in the same category? No, but I, I, hmm. I don't have a young kid anymore, but I do have young dogs around and I know that they do better. If they are, you know, if they expect a, a walk at a specific time, well, they're going to be looking forward to that walk and they're, and it's going to be a good time for them. And then the rest of the day, they're perfectly happy to sleep. Yeah. No, you know? but I think that that's true. I think that there's a lot more structure mm-hmm. in structure. The that's the word I was looking for. There really is. And there's a lot of structure in their daily activities and there's a lot of structure. But at the same time, I think that French parents, perhaps because there is all that structure, they don't hover over the children in a way that American parents tend to do so that if they're in a situation where they can be allowed to roam a little bit or be free, Mm -hmm. the the leash is a little longer Mm -hmm, in France. mm -hmm, It's mm -hmm. very interesting to see the difference. And there's this confidence that most of the time that's okay, you know. I find yeah. it very interesting to see the difference. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, French French society is kind of not very violent. I mean, you don't... Not you, usually. Not no. usually. No shootings, no... I mean, what could happen to your kid is that their cell phone gets stolen. You know? Right. But, but I mean, I'm thinking it more in terms of even the confidence. For instance, um, parents at the beach with smaller children... They, they will keep an eye on them, but from a greater distance, physical uh-huh, distance, uh-huh, uh-huh. they won't be hovering over them, you know, yeah. be careful, you know, do this, do that. And it's, it seems like there's the confidence that helps the children. I, that's my impression. Yeah, yeah, really, yeah. You know. Well, you do have to let kids be kids. Otherwise, yeah. they'll never grow up to be adults either. So anyway, we're, we're kind of off on yeah, a, but different. it's an interesting, <laughs> it's an interesting topic. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And, and there is definitely, def- I mean, Anytime you turn on NPR, they're, they're doing a different story about how French kids eat better, are healthier, are better behaved, and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's like Lake Wobegon. <laughs> well, eat better. I don't think there's any question about that. So, <clears throat> yeah, well, French people still cook meals at home, and which is together in the evening. Yeah, and we eat together at dinner. And, and, and it's funny because most French kitchens are so tiny compared yes. to American kitchens. We hardly spend any money on our kitchens <laughs> compared to Americans, but we cook all the time. Like we use the kitchen. Yes. I always, it's always funny to me when I walk into these American homes, I have these, and I might be offending some listeners here, please. Don't take this the wrong way. It's perfectly fine for you to have a big American home and stainless steel everywhere. But it's kind of funny because you have all these uh, commercial appliances in your in your kitchen and you never cook. <laughs> it's it's really crazy. Whereas French women have these tiny little you know gas burner. They might be hauling a, a gas tank. Uh, oh, not too many anymore. But but you know, in this house, when I had a gas stovetop. I, I, there's no city gas coming to my house. And so I had to use a tank. I used to, I had to use a tank. So anyway, you, when we, I'm, I've moved up in the world, you know, <laughs> don't give me that dirty look. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but, uh, um, French, French people do more with less is what I'm trying to say. All right. Are we going to get no comment? <laughs> no. <laughs> Otherwise, well, this is just going to go on forever. I thought. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Well, we've only been 10 minutes into this. It's okay. It's no, but it's, it's a whole topic. A, it's okay. a long intro. It's a long intro. It's a long intro that has nothing to do with the topic anyway. <laughs> anyway, so do tell me about today's topic. <laughs> oh, well, 
Well, let me see now. Today's topic, I actually was uh, would like to talk about some of the parks in Toulouse. Mm-hmm. And specifically, uh, talk a little bit about the history of them in relation to the city of Toulouse, because obviously, I shouldn't say that too many times, but different cities in different parts of France have a, a different relationship to the parks that they have. Right. But Toulouse, because of its history and its physical history, being a city that for centuries and centuries was, was walled in mm-hmm. inside its ramparts, the... Um, the development of open green space was a very big event. And I mm-hmm. just a week ago did a walk and took some people through some of these parks. And I thought it would be an interesting topic to talk about. And very vaguely, um, I'll mention because it's another whole thing that we can talk about in another episode, the whole business of what's the difference between a park and a garden. Okay. Be- because that really, those are words that really on some level have different meaning Mm-hmm. specifically how they're used in, in Western Europe, uh, in Italy and in France, and uh, in and there are the differences between the what those concepts are here and in Italy and in England. For okay, instance, okay, you know? that would be interesting. So um I certainly don't know. Okay, well we'll talk about it a little bit. Okay. And and the, <laughs> and there are now one of the other things that's interesting about Toulouse is that except for one very, very tiny, tiny little museum that's in an old uh, 16th century mansion in the old city center. Every other museum that has been remodeled has had an, a garden attached or surrounding it so that they're very pleasant to go to because yeah. <clears throat> they're not just this mineral building where you go in and out of a building and you're on a sidewalk. There are three that are very beautiful that have large gardens and or parks around them. Mm-hmm. And so it's a, you can make a kind of combination visit when you visit them. And as you say, in the summertime, that's something that people really want to have. Of course. To have nice greenery, uh, grass to sit on, tr- trees to sit under. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Beautiful it's, flowers. It's, it's a big deal. And you know, it's kind of funny because 200 years ago, it was a huge luxury to have a, a proper sidewalk, to have a proper street, a paved area. That's right. What you'd call mineral today, too mineral. Yes. Well, for the longest time, that's what people wanted was they wanted the dirt covered up and not in their feet anymore, you know, in their shoes and their clothes and everything. Uh, and, and now we're, we're so paved over. Yes. In our cities, uh, you don't see a bit of dirt anywhere. No. And people kind of crave that. They, they crave that. And of course, it does relieve the, the, not just the, the feeling of, uh, there's a kind of tension when you live all the time with concrete and, and, and things that are just solid like that. But also it helps cool off the air. You know, when yes. you have some greenery and, and gardens. It does. And it's very hard having grown up in uh, New York City, Mm -hmm. uh, which has, of course, a couple of very big parks, but Mm -hmm. there's not a lot of greenery on every corner, at least in certain parts of the city. Yeah. Uh, And having spent a lot of time in Paris, uh, there there are pocket parks, and then there are very big open-spaced parks on the outer edges. But after a while, when you walk around, especially at the time of the year when it's hot, you crave. Yeah. You just literally crave to have a little bit of greenery. Yes. You know? And the <clears throat> coolness of, you know, especially if you go to a park where they've been watering the plants, or right. it kind of evaporates and it feels good. It to, feels good. Yeah. And this year it's been pretty hot already. And it's been hot already. Yeah. So. so we we do crave that sort of thing. So I thought we could talk a little bit about the history then of the very first parks or open public gardens mm-hmm. that were created in Toulouse. And believe it or not, um, the very first one was created in 1751. Mm. That's a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> It's a fairly long time ago. That's what, 265 years ago. Yeah. And it was created at exactly the same time they started working on the building of the new capital, the city hall. Okay. At exactly the same time, because it was a period when <clears throat> there was a lot of uh, um, the, the idea of urban renovation suddenly took hold in the middle of the 18th century. And, uh, but the man who was responsible in Toulouse 
for giving us the very first of these beautiful uh, garden parks is a man named Louis Mondran. Hmm. Louis Mondran. Oui, Louis Mondran. M-O-N-D-R-A-N. Okay. And uh, what happened was he had gone, he was from here, he had gone up to Paris. He was a magistrate. He was from the upper class. Mm-hmm. And he had uh, seen some of the uh, things they were trying to work on and do in Paris. But he also went to England. Mm-hmm. And what happened was when he visited uh, London, and I don't know actually where else he went in England, but what happened was he came back and he came back to Toulouse and he said that he wanted to start working on modernizing this incredibly walled-in medieval city. Right. Which, of course, it had its glory days, which mm-hmm. were long gone. <laughs> And it was a city that uh, was really kind of, it's a horrible word to use, but it was festering mm. inside the walls because the narrow medieval streets were very dark. There was really, uh, at that point, still no running water in the fountains because after a period of time where things had worked very well, things didn't work very well for a long, long time in the city. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was there was no way for the city to innovate inside the walls. Right, right. So uh, he was a man of great influence. He had a certain amount of wealth and he had a great amount of influence on the city council. Mm -hmm. And so he convinced them, but over a period of years, because what we're talking is expenses, right? Yeah, yeah. And it takes money, yeah. Takes money, right? Yeah. Just for the land. Even the code of Hammurabi in ancient Babylon had to do with taxes, right? I mean, the... the I've never heard of that. The the Rosetta Stone was, was... about accounts, you know, with paying for oh, the weed. Oh, oh. I mean, all of these things, when you think about it, as far as back as the first urban sedentary civilization, the, the documents that we have that are almost the oldest in the world have to do with paying taxes. Yeah, taxes and money kind of and counting things. Think about it, counting, yeah. counting things. They wanted right? to keep track of how many of whatever they right. had, you know, how many horses, how many chariots, exactly. how many whatever. Yeah. So Louis Mondron, it took him a number of years to really convince the city council of Toulouse that they needed to create an open green space that would be available to everybody. So he said 1751. He's uh, 1751. He had actually been to England and come back and he came back with these ideas. They didn't actually start the work on these uh, open parks or gardens, uh, Um, I'll talk a little bit about what the difference is in a sense in a minute for a number of years because there was a great deal of resistance. And also, he was also responsible for the idea of trying to break down some of the ramparts around the city. But what he did was he chose some of the farmland that was on the south side, Mm -hmm. the south and slightly southeast side of the city. Mm -hmm. And what had happened was that over the centuries, these enormous brick ramparts that surrounded the old city, people on the outside, uh, the poor people were basically living on the outside and some of them had built little huts in various places. You know, they kind of made them up against the walls, Mm -hmm. but on other parts, there were trenches. There were never, uh, there was never moats uh, Mm -hmm. around the city, but there were actually trenches and these big wide trenches. He said, what we're going to do is instead of having them used either for throwing as a dump for throwing garbage, which is what was being done in some parts of them, which was probably very smelly and unsightly and Mm -hmm. unhealthy, Mm -hmm. uh, in other parts on the nice side of the city, these open spaces were basically used to plant some things and then people would just kind of walk there occasionally. And so he said, okay, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to fill in all of this trench Mm -hmm. and make a walkway. That's on the outside of the walls. And that way it kind of creates a sense of promenade, at least through a part Mm, of it. mm. And he said, and then what what we're going to do is we're going to take some of this land and we're going to create a garden space. And the very first one that was created was the one that still to this day is called the Royal Garden. Yes. Yes. And it's not very big. (laughs) That's true. I think it's about two and a half hectare, which is what, five acres. It's mm-hmm, not much bigger than mm-hmm. that. It's really not very big at all. But of course, why was it called the Royal Garden? Ha ha. This is always the, this is the, the thing with people from Toulouse. It's called Royal because they got money from the king. I see. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. They were going to call the capital Royal Square, 
They got the money from the king. Yeah. They never called it the Royal Square. Yeah. No. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay. Once I got the money, you know, I do what I want. I do what I want. Right? <laughs> but this time, they actually did. So yeah. was the Royal, uh, Jardin Royal, was it on the exterior then of the yes. city walls at yes. the time? I yes. See. And, and, and in fact. Because uh, well, today it's like dead center of the city. I mean, well, it's not, not really it's, dead. It's okay, not. It's a little bit off, but not It's that actually much. off. It's still, uh, south. It's actually the southeast side. But, okay, but okay. if you, if you go to it, because there were two parts that were built simultaneously. The Royal Garden part, which is very small and is more like a, um, what the, the, it's not a rectangle, but it's almost like a rectangle in, yeah, in yeah, form. Yeah. But the part that was the great innovation, which was his, uh, the beginning of his, what he called his, his idea for a greater plan for the city of Toulouse was the part that we now call the Grand Rond. Uh huh. Which in fact, not too far officially from, yeah. is called the Boulangrin. Grand. Right. Boulangrin. Grand, yeah. Boulangrin. Grand, why? Because when he had gone to England, he had seen the parks huh, in London. Bowling green. And it's a bowling green. <laughs> and so when they came back. I never thought of that. Yes, indeed. It's a bowling green. No. And so oh. they took bowling green and he, it became boulang green. I love it. I just yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah, love yeah. it. Right? And oh, it is yeah. actually, uh, it's, it's really on paper. Now it's boulingrin, right? It's it, I-N. B-O-U-L-I-N. It's either I N or E N and then G R I N. Hmm. Yeah. I think it's I N. I will check it. But he wanted what he wanted to do, and which he actually more or less succeeded in doing, was create a space that would have a lot of activity. So, of course, uh, he wanted to have uh, the equivalent of what the, the, it would be like patank in a sense, you know, the games the with, with the, yeah, it would yeah. be like the, the, what they called bowling at that time was outside. It was using pins, you know, and right. it was a game. But also, if you take a look at a map, and I'm going to show you something because you're sitting opposite from me, and I'm just going to show you because this is, in fact, the original plan of what he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like a mini version of the Place de l'Etoile in Paris. It sure does. And his original plan was to have six big avenues, big, wide, straight avenues, spoke out from this magnificent round park. And the whole purpose of it was to provide a space that would be available for everyone, no matter what their class, no matter what their situation, so that they could use it and have greenery. Because otherwise, you go into farmland that was all privately owned, mm -hmm. or you're inside the city, which has absolutely no greenery unless you're a landowner and you're a tiny little park on the inside. So, so this is the canal on the side. I mean, I'll, I'll scan yes. this. Uh, don't leave so this without is, me scanning this. This is on, on one side. Uh, this is the river. Yeah, yeah. And the the other, river or the canal? Here, you have, on one side, you have... The canal on the other side of the river, but very, uh -huh. this is, no, I guess this is right. This is the canal up here. This is right. This is the wall. This yeah, is the canal, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. So what he did was he, he tried to get as much money as he could because he wanted to make this very, very big. And inside the park, it was designated that there would be these activities, basically the concept of a bowling green. And also it was made to be a very slightly oval form mm. because they had uh, the plan was to have pony races <laughs> and to have a big space in the middle where people could congregate. <laughs> and all around it are trees that are planted. But as you can see, it's kind of planted in concentric circles. Yeah, it looks very organized. It, it's very organized. It's yeah. because in spite of the fact that what he wanted was something that he uh, got the idea for from going to England, uh, Mr. Mondron was French after all. <laughs> and in France... A park and a garden are geometric and they are composed. And there is no mm -hmm. such thing as wilderness in a park. That is, yeah. you don't create a park that looks like nature um, that hasn't been touched by man. Mm -hmm. And the English idea of a park was very much the opposite. This is really 18th century. This is a new idea. The idea that you create a space that is indeed created by people, mm -hmm. but you make it look like it hasn't been created by people. Right. So an English park or an English garden, an English garden is wildflowers growing and lots of things, even though they're planted by people, they're basically designed to look like there's a little bit of haphazardness. Right. In them. And an English park is a park that is specifically designed with the idea that 
every time you turn a corner, you will see something different mm. and that nothing is symmetrical. So you don't have things that are like classical architecture, two sides the same, mm -hmm. or like in an Italian garden or in the French garden, like in the Tuileries, everything is designed. The trees are all cut to look a certain shape. Everything is very carefully laid yeah. out geometrically. Yeah. And in Paris, it's actually very striking to see how they, in Versailles is where I noticed it the most. The trees are cut to be rectangles. Rectangles. Topiary. Yeah. They're, they're very, it's very strange to see this big long line of trees and they all look like big rectangles. That's right. That's <laughs> I don't know how they cut them that way. They must have machines. They that... have, you know, they go up on the top of this little extension thing on the back of the trucks and you see the guys with their and they big, work that way. Yeah. Big scissors cutting. You yeah. Know? Yeah. It's yeah. actually a, like a saw kind of thing. Yeah. It's really interesting. It's and really it's interesting. pretty. It's very pretty, but it's, it's very, very manicured. Yes. Very yes. manicured. Yes. So Mr. Mondrand. He was someone who was very excited. This was his mission. The other thing was, very interestingly, that this is uh, just about a hundred years after the opening of the Canal du Midi. Mm -hmm. And he had another idea that was very similar to the idea that uh, Riquet had had, the man who was responsible for building the Canal du Midi. Right. He wanted to also include small but very good uh, houses for poor people who were mostly the people that lived outside the walls of the city because there weren't that many really poor people who lived inside the city. It was a very much a middle class and a slightly upper class city. Mm -hmm. And so the plan was to create this grand rond, yeah, his bowling green, to provide places for people to have all these activities. And specifically in his writings, he talked about it being for the working class, for the lower middle class as, as such in the 18th century, that it was for a, a place for people who really didn't have very much available to them to come and pro take advantage of the, the greenery, of the planting of flowers, of having some benches and everything else. And so what happened well, was... And when I was little, the Grand Rond had even... They, it had a, a mini zoo, like a... We will, a yes. A, almost a petting zoo or well, something. Well, yes, and we'll talk about that in a minute because yeah. that had to do more with the Jardin des Plantes, which of course yeah, came okay. immediately after. Mm -hmm. Basically, what we're talking about is everything that was taken care of between the 1750s and the end of the 1700s. So you have three parts that are all connected. You have the Royal Garden, which is the smaller one over here. Yes. You have the Grand Rond, yeah. and then the extension of that, which became the Jardin des Plantes. Okay, okay. okay. Which was where... Yeah, they're all kind of linked. They're all they're not linked. far away from each other. Exactly. Yeah. So, of course, what happened was that the city put up a fair amount of resistance because it's money that you mm -hmm, have to invest. Mm -hmm. And why invest in money for something that's not necessarily for the wealthy in the city. <laughs> so he he had to fight. That's a he, good question. He really <laughs> had to fight, and he had to fight for a, a number of years to actually get the money to start the building of it. And mm -hmm. what happened was he wound up being able to build four of the spokes. In other words, oh. two of the roads that were opened up were finally built, The, th the last one was never quite built until the 20th century or mm. the end of the 19th century. And so he opened up these broad avenues. And again, coming out of a medieval city with these narrow, twisted little streets. Yeah, this is very different. This is very different. Yeah. And, it was, and, and so the irony of all of this is that as soon as the first two parts, which were the Royal Garden and the Grand Ronde, as soon as they were finished... It wasn't the lower class people who wound up taking advantage of it. It was all the wealthy people who lived <laughs> on that side of the city of Toulouse who basically took it over. Mm, mm. And uh, I don't even know. I mean, theoretically, the big deal was that this was the first time that there were open public gardens and mm -hmm. green spaces mm -hmm. At least here in Toulouse. I yeah, mean, yeah. You know, I mean, I'm not sure about the dates for other places. Yeah. But for here, this was a big deal. And yet, what happened was that it was the upper class population that basically pushed out, at least in the sense of dominating the occupation mm -hmm. of the space. And what happened was they installed their pony rides, their pony races. <laughs> they had, uh, and still today, you know, on Sundays, uh, there's dancing in the Grand Rome. They had a huge gazebo. I don't know what a gazebo is in English, actually. A gazebo. It's a gazebo. A beautiful one uh, built. 
and they had a band that yeah, it's was a band in it. Stand it's a bandstand, yeah. And they had, of course, uh, and then they started because it was basically upper class taste. They started putting sculpture into the gone room, right, right. And it turned out that everyone loved it. Everyone thought it was very beautiful, but unfortunately. A lot of the lower class people, a lot of the poor people were not able to really fully take advantage of it because once the upper class people started to go there and they did immediately, they actually started to complain mm-hmm. to the city of all the riffraff of all the riffraff coming yeah. when, uh, and so Mondron was uh, at the very end when all of this was done, was quite unhappy about this mm. because he was actually a social reformer mm. and one of his main uh, motivations for doing all of this was to make a healthier city for all the people inside it. Mm-hmm. But it's very strange because it, if he had wanted to do this and make it really for the lower classes, he should have, I don't know if it was physically possible, but he should have put this on the north side of the city mm-hmm. because the south side was the area where we are, <laughs> which is, which is the, where the parliamentarians were. Mm. And so since this was close to the cathedral of Saint Etienne and it was close to where the old vestiges of the chateau of the counts were, this is where all the uh, members of the parliament, all the aristocratic people, this is basically the part of the city where they lived. Mm. So it was much easier for them to walk out the gates of what still was the, w- the walls of yeah. the city and say, oh, look, we now have this beautiful, beautiful green area yeah. with these beautiful sculptures and all of these things to yeah. do. Yeah. But the fact is, it was a huge success mm-hmm. right away. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Even too much of a success. Too much of a success. Yeah. And at the same time, uh, thanks to uh, Louis the Fourteenth, which was a, basically the time of the Canal du Midi, they had created what they call the uh, Société Savante. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, these were the intellectual societies. And one of them was a botanical society. So the Savants Society. Savant. Like the, uh, <laughs> it's, it's the... Botanical Society. It, it's a botanical the society. Astrological. It, it, w- it was under Louis XIV that they had the mm-hmm. creation of the first uh, botanical gardens mm-hmm. and the first uh, parks of bringing in exotic animals from other parts of the world and things like mm-hmm. that. So contiguous in terms of space... Where you'll, you'll scan this and you'll show everybody. Yeah. Contiguous with the, where the Royal Garden was and on the other side of one of the two long boulevards that Mondrian had created, mm-hmm. they took the land which had belonged to. What's the number? There's a number. On this, it's uh, basically between numbers two and three. On okay. This, okay. Okay. <clears throat> so if you go to join us in France forward slash 76. And you'll, you'll, look at the you'll see what she's talking about. Right. And, and what they did was they took land that was just right next to it. So we're still, st- we're talking really the south side of these ramparts, which are still there. Mm-hmm. Nobody's done anything about taking the ramparts down. And it was land that had belonged to a monastery. Ah. And it was a monastery of the, uh, it was called the, um, the Moine des Chaussées. The mm. Carmelite des Chaussées. So des Chaussées meaning they without had, shoes. They didn't. Yeah, and I still don't know if that means they wore sandals uh, as opposed to closed shoes or whether for some reason or another they walked around with no shoes on. I don't know. Uh, I, uh, I have to confess I really don't I would have know. to one day she'll see. I'm, I might look it up. <laughs> I might look it up and put it on the website if I find out. I really don't know. But it, I mean, I couldn't blame you if that's, if that's not what it means because that's what the word means. That's what it means, Why right? would they be called one day she'll see if... If they wear shoes, if they wear shoes, so but maybe simple shoes, maybe they wore like espadrille or something, right? The, or the just espadrille is the sandals or something. Yeah, yeah, espadrille. I don't know if you use that word in English very no, much. No, um, espadrilles. Yeah. Espadrilles. Yeah, they're called espadrilles. So these are the cheapo, like ten euro cloth and co- cord. Yeah, they're made of uh, string and right. and cloth. And I don't. But they're cheapo. It, it's very strange. But what happened was the city took some of their land. Mm-hmm. They had all the land on the south side of the, the walls mm-hmm. going out as we go towards what you and I know is the, car, the neighborhood of Saint-Michel. Uh-huh. Okay? And uh, the city confiscated or bought, I'm not sure which, a uh, section of this land. Mm-hmm. And they set up the very first botanical garden. Mm-hmm. Now, it wasn't a park. 
at first. It was strictly a research center. Uh, it was really for experimenting with plants and flowers, and it was a research center for uh, botanics. Mm. And what happened was that in 1789, guess what we have? Of course, we have the French Revolution. The Revolution yeah. And at that point, the monastery was emptied of the monks. Mm -hmm. The city took over the rest of the land that they had. Hey, yay, new land. We take it. And guess what they did? They made that into a big park. Ah. So the park itself that we now call the Botanical Gardens, which is inaccurate because the Botanical Gardens is only a small part of what the whole big park is there. Mm -hmm. It's a very big park. And what they did was there, instead of making it into a French garden, very manicured with all of these alleys and, and geometric forms. Mm -hmm. They made it into an English park. I see. And that is partly, I think, because it had been the botanical gardens. Mm -hmm. So there to this day, of course, which is, it's the biggest of the three of these big parts mm -hmm. that are all kind of, you're right, it's one big system, if we want to call it yeah, that. Right? Yeah, you can easily walk between one you and the other. You can walk between one and the other. It's, yeah. a much, it's very much the biggest one. It has, till this day, a part of it that is indeed a botanical garden, that is a research, research center, mm -hmm. but also, unlike the other two parts, you have these wonderful curved trails mm -hmm. that meander around very big, big, big trees, very beautiful trees, and nothing is symmetrical. Oh, okay. so when you walk, that's very different. It's, it's true. Very, I had never different. thought of that, but yeah, you're right. When you go through from one part to the other, you really are walking. No, we know it's a park. It's not. Yeah, it's tended to. I it's mean, obviously. tended to. Yeah. And there's some beautiful grass and there's yeah. a little bit of a rose garden in one corner mm -hmm. and there are different trees. And now, of course, and I, that's since the beginning of the 19th century, there are certain places where there are labels so that you know what kind of tree it is because they wanted to extend the concept of the botanical garden at the same time making it into an open park space. Mm -hmm. And that is, of course, thanks to what happened after the revolution that they decided that this would find finally be the open greenery that originally was supposed to be the round bowling green. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what happened was they built the very uh, the buildings that were part of, it wasn't the very first, but it became the, the more important uh, medical school. So the big section, there's a section, you know, when yeah, you go in that way, those buildings. Yeah, it's called the pharmacy, doesn't it, on the building? It was actually the very first of, uh, after the revolution. It was where they put the medical school. Hmm. Yeah, I don't remember what the building says. There's an engraving on the building. The one that's next to the Museum of Natural History. Mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, those buildings I were... It said it could be that one was pharmacy. the pharmacy and one was the medical school yeah, because I doubt if they, they were, usually keep them together. And they were probably Even just the one modern. big building at the time. You know, it wasn't mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. today you have a campus with zillions of buildings on it. Mm -hmm. um, but they put them there because, of course, uh, people use plants a lot in medicinal research, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which, of yeah, course, they still sense. do. So you it can, made a lot of yeah. sense. And then what happened was, interestingly enough, uh, the the... The parks were, of course, all three of them, a huge, huge success right away. And little by little, starting in the 1800s, they went back to the first two, that is the Royal Garden, which is the smallest of the three. And it is really butt up against what were the ramparts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then the Grand Ronde, which is the Bowling Green. And they started, they didn't change them. Those two were still somewhat more symmetrical, although Bowling Green is the one that's the most symmetrical. But they started doing what became the fashion in the 1800s, and they added a huge amount of sculpture to both of them. Yeah. Uh, they added a and little bit. And they look very nice. They look very nice. Yeah. And they took the Royal Garden, and they redid it. Now, I'm not sure exactly why, but it was originally much, much more like the Grand Ronde, that is, okay. it was much closer to that in the sense that it had uh, plants. Symmetrical. Symmetrical. The plants were all cut into funny yeah, shapes. Yeah, because I was going to say that one's, a, I mean, it's not like a English garden. But, completely, no. But, but it's not it as, you it's know, not square. As, it's and, not as rigorous, no. And right angles and all of that. And apparently what happened was, I don't know exactly why, but in the 1840s, they decided to undo 
some of the geometric elements of it, and they made a part of it into what really is a corner that looks like an English garden, so that you have a tiny little pond, yeah, which is very pretty, and yeah. a teeny little little footbridge that goes across. It's a good place for wedding photography in Toulouse. It's beautiful. <laughs> and it has a couple of the oldest trees in Toulouse. Mm -hmm. There's a monumental tree there. There is nothing. I was just there the other day looking to see if there was a sign that indicates how old the tree is, but there isn't anything. Anyway, it's a huge monumental tree, and I'm just wondering if it could be from the original park. I don't know if it would hmm. be a tree that's two, uh, over 250 years old. It certainly well, is possible. Tree. I mean, there's a tree near here in L'Union, a little uh, suburb street of uh, suburb uh, town of Toulouse. They have an olive tree that's a thousand years old. Yeah, olive trees do live a long time. You know, it's and but on that one there's a plaque. Right. But uh, you know, I, I it would be curious. I would love to know if somebody in the Museum of Natural History knows how old this particular yeah, tree is. I'm sure some people know. So what you have then is the old little royal garden, which is now this very beautiful mm -hmm. space because you have, it's very refreshing. There are ducks on the little pond. There's this little bridge that crosses over it. It You, you kind of do this meander. Yeah, it's, it, it's beautiful in an understated kind of way. In it's an understated not kind of way. trying to be grandiose. No. It's not... And at the same time, so, when, let me, th yeah, yeah, just, I was just going to say, they, when they redid the Royal Garden, they added the footbridge mm. that goes from the Royal Garden to the Grand Ronde, which is this beautiful little iron footbridge that curves up and arches over the road. The street, yeah. And uh, that was actually done at that time. It mm. was one of the very first structures in iron like that done in the city of Toulouse. Mm -hmm. And that takes you, of course, into the Grand Ronde. And the Grand Ronde was when, that was when they started filling it up with all kinds of sculptures, different mm -hmm. kinds of sculpture. And of course, the Grand Ronde did stay uh, a place for the upper classes to, to hang out. Uh, if you go there now, It's not the upper classes necessarily, but it's still a very posh neighborhood right around yeah, there. Yeah, it has a lot of uh, buildings that look uh, Osmanian almost. Like uh, they well, have, uh, the, it's not quite, s there's stone as well as brick. Let's that's put right. it that way. It's not all brick like the right. rest of Toulouse. It's Because there were a lot of buildings that were built there starting it in the 19th century. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and of course it stayed the area that's closest to the old ramparts Mm -hmm. which didn't come down till the 1840s and 50s, mm -hmm. uh, stayed and has been for centuries a very, very, very posh part of Toulouse. Yeah. And then they added these beautiful, on the new streets with these beautiful apartment buildings, you know, with all the ironwork and everything on them. Yeah. So it's very interesting because it stayed that way. To this day, if you go there on a Sunday, uh, the bandstand gazebo has free dancing. Mm -hmm. uh, some weekends it's rock, rock. Sometimes it's tango. Um, I was just telling somebody the other day, anybody can go. You don't have to pay or anything like that. It's kind of fun. It's like when you and I, we live, you even more than I, we live outside the city. So it's not the kind of thing you think of, oh yeah, I'm just going to go there. But <laughs> if you happen to be in yeah, the it's city, very fun. it's really fun. And of course, in the big, big park, which is the uh, Jardin des Plantes, They added not only sculpture, but after the revolution, they took sections of the walls from the Middle Ages and particularly one section that's actually from the Renaissance. Don't ask me how they were able to do this, but they actually took a huge, magnificent Renaissance doorway and they moved it to the park. I know what you mean. Yep. I've seen it. This is, it's so, kind of strange it's standing strange. right there. And it was done <laughs> so that... Uh, Uh, it was very explicitly done so that people would remember mm -hmm. the heritage of the architecture that had existed because in the 1800s, an enormous amount of the old Renaissance architecture was destroyed. Right. And you would think going there today, you would think, oh, that might be where the old wall used to be. It's on the outside. But in we other know words, it's, it's not. It's basically the old wall, uh, parts of it are still visible But it really runs along the line of the new tramway. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And a section of it is right next to the Palais de Justice, the, yeah. the old court, the courthouse. And part of that wall is inside the courthouse. the courthouse. Yes. And you can see th that all of this park is literally created on the outskirts, just outside these mm -hmm, walls. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. Then, of course, they added, starting in the 1700s, not only the Botanical Garden, but the Museum of Natural History. 
Now, I have a question for you. Mm. I don't know if you can answer this. Mm. Why is a museum of natural history in French called a museum and all other kinds of... Museum. And why are there kinds of museums called (laughs) musées? I don't understand why. I don't know either. But if if it says museum... It's a museum of natural history. Yeah. So if it's spelled the English way... Right. It's natural history. Right. It always is. Always is. But if it's spelled musée, M-U-S-E-E, right. then it's some it's, other kind. It's some other kind. It might be just to separate it, to make it... I don't it, know. I'm, I'll try and see if I can find out. But I have no idea, really. Really, because, yeah. you know, obviously, if you think of it, there's the Museum of Aviation, Museum of Medicine. All of those, not only the museums of art, are called musée. Yeah. And only the one that has to do with natural history is called a museum. So I would yeah. really be curious to know why. <laughs> just it's very they strange. Just wanted, they kept the Latin word. They yeah, wanted they kept more the Latin authority. word. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, but it's very interesting. So if you, so we have, we happen to have in the Jardin des Plantes, which is the biggest of these three beautiful historical parks, the Museum of Natural History, which uses the old convent buildings. In fact, their lobby is magnificent because they kept the cloister mm-hmm. of the old convent and the arcades enter uh, into part of the museum and the other arcades on one side enter into the restaurant part. And they managed to really do a very good job of keeping the internal structure of the beautiful cloister. And it happens. Now, I'm just saying what I've read and what I've been told that it's the second most interesting collection in terms of a museum of natural history in France outside of Paris. It's a nice one. I don't know if, you know how it compares to the others, but it's a it's a really nice. It's natural a really history nice museum. One. Yes, it has. It's all been cons- redone. It's recently. been redone very recently. Yeah, it's very good. And they have a lot of things that go back uh, to prehistory. They also have a huge collection of animal exhibits. And, of course, one of the nice things is they do a lot of activities with uh, small children. They have a great, great, great bookshop for uh, getting things for small children mm-hmm. in the museum. Mm-hmm. And, of course, it makes sense. We need to pause for a second. The cat brought in a lizard and is trying to kill it under my eyes. I'm going to rescue the lizard. Okay, I'm back. I saved the lizard. It was a baby lizard. This cat brings in all sorts of things in here, like beetles and she has killed so many beetles i don't know where she finds the beetles because i never see a beetle in my yard anyway sorry about that she did, well, she belongs in the museum of natural history <laughs> she, she collects she collects dead things for things. them maybe she's being paid by them but she she didn't get she didn't kill the beetles. no them. no this one's this one's safe <laughs> anyway the these three uh parks are really they're there are two other parks that are really wonderful and very beautiful in Toulouse that are more recent, but these are the three that have a great historical uh, yeah. value, Which and I mean, they're I mean, also very, very story. beautiful. You know, yeah, they're really lovely. And of course, it's interesting to know that, uh, just like in other parts of France, the idea of open free green space was a revelation in the 18th century. That prior to that, if you were a peasant or if you lived out in the countryside, it was one thing. But the notion in an urban space of open greenery where Mm -hmm. you could enjoy shade from trees and have maybe a little pond and have animals was something really new starting in the 18th century. And mentioning what you mentioned about the animals, yes, um, you grew up in, in Toulouse and you knew this. And I've heard from my husband, who has been here for a long time too, that when he first arrived in Toulouse, there were lots of animals still in the Jardin des Plantes. Right. Because they had indeed created a small zoo. Yeah, it was a zoo. Of some, I mean, they had some exotic animals. I remember... Monkeys, apparently. Yeah, monkeys, uh, birds, exotic birds. Um, they had a... You know, I mean, they didn't have a giraffe or anything, but no. they had some exotic animals. And I know that uh, there were donkeys, there were monkeys, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> there were uh, cows... And in, there were a couple of sheep. And in fact, uh, from what I know, all of that stopped in the ninth, end of the 1970s, except for having the birds, because there were still amazing right. peacocks in the, in the park yeah, there yeah, and, yeah. and all kinds of strange 
exotic looking chickens, you know, but the peacocks are amazing. Uh, yeah, this is a, this is a French thing. I don't know if Americans do this or Canadians or Australians or whatever. Uh, the people have chickens. In, they have fancy chickens. Fancy here. chickens. People, I mean, my, Very my next door neighbor keeps fancy chickens. Really? He collects them. Does he collect them or does he eat them? I don't want to know. Okay. No, I don't think he eats the them. ones in the park. Obviously, I, nobody eats. I, you know? I think if he was killing chickens right next to me, I would hear it. Yeah, you probably. I would. don't. I don't hear. I think he breeds them and maybe sells them or something. But he he has a big old chicken coop not far, and um and sometimes you get a peek at the chickens, and some of them are pretty gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some of them have <laughs> these magnificent feathers. Yeah. But what happened was apparently in the 1970s the uh, people that were living near the park and they started building these very big, fancy new apartment buildings right after World War II, right around on the other side of the uh, Jardin des Plantes. Mm -hmm. They complained about the noises and the smells of having cows and donkeys uh, and all of these farm animals in the park. And so they got rid of them. Yeah. Well, you know, I think there's a lot to this idea of city people wanted the city to be a city, a proper city without live animals, you yeah. know? And so it's it's a new development that we want to bring in some country into the city. It's not maybe, but it's interesting that it was maybe because it was farm animals. You know, I don't I don't really know because mm -hmm. there is still a donkey ride on weekends in the Jardin des Plantes, yeah. but it's a guy who comes with his donkey and, and sets it up and sets it up, and it's for little children. You know, yeah. to to be walked around the part of the park. There's even a very beautiful little fake. Uh, waterfall, which is very typical of the kind of thing they've done in many of the parks in Paris. It's very lovely, and you can hear the water kind of going, tick, 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 you know, as it falls down, mm -hmm. and it's very nice on a on a hot day. I got in you know. trouble recently for calling a, a small horse a, a donkey. I thought it. I mean. Yeah, when she told me, no, it's not a, it's not a donkey, it's a horse. And once I paid attention to the ears and the, it was just so small. Right. It just looked like a, it was a miniature. It's a small horse that they use for therapy with oh. uh, children who have various disabilities and, and uh, it looked really cool. Yeah, but it was. But uh, but nowadays they bring animals into this. They bring to animals do things in. like right, that. Exactly. But it's just for short thing. Right. Okay, I gotta ask you my question. I never got to ask you my question earlier. Why do you think there's is there's such a big difference between the English gardens and the French gardens? You mean why? okay? Well, I, why why do we insist on? B because I think um, the heritage of English of of French gardens is actually Italian gardens. Oh, okay. I, in, in, in France, prior to, uh, the very beginning, the end of the middle ages, the beginning of the Renaissance, the, um, I don't think that the French nobility was particularly interested in or thought about creating any kind of formal gardens and parks. Mm -hmm. And the f first place where they were created was in fact in Italy starting, I think, really far back, maybe in the 11th or 1200s, you know, that kind mm -hmm, of, mm -hmm. really relatively far back. And the, the Italian garden is symmetrical, okay. uh, shaped uh, with alleys that you walk down with very interesting geometric forms. It's very formal. It's the whole concept of the aesthetic being a very controlled aesthetic. And uh, it suits the French mentality because you have to think that in France... Uh, the whole business of the the um, société savante, for instance, yeah. the, the idea that you have intellectual societies for every field of of, uh, of intellectual research or endeavor, uh, which create rules and regulations. Now, all of this was really begun under Louis the Thirteenth, but specifically, mostly under Louis the Fourteenth. You have everything is very much controlled and regulated. Mm -hmm. And that goes for gardens as well. Yeah. Okay. So what you have, you know, here, the perfect example, of course, is uh, Le Nôtre and, and the gardens in, in Versailles. Right, right. Because there's a sense of domination of nature. And there's a sense of the aesthetic. The, the whole question is an aesthetic question of how do you make this beautiful? The idea of what was beautiful in the case of French and Italians was much more what you can shape and form that way. Interestingly enough... The English have always preferred gardens. In a sense, it's imagine the concept. I've, I think of it this way. 
the English, like the Japanese, live on an island. And in order to appreciate nature, you create something that reminds you of the grandiose quality of nature, but you have to create it on a reduced scale because you only have a limited amount of space. Now in Japan, that turned into bonsai, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is what they do when they make their small miniature Trees. trees. It's exactly the same form as the trees that you have up in the mountains, but it was created because they had such limited space to Mm -hmm. have greenery, but the greenery is important to them. But they don't try to make the greenery look other than like a miniature version of what the real thing is. Yeah. Yeah. And in England, uh, I think that the idea was that when you create a park, you create a park that is indeed controlled by humans, but you want it to have the look and feel of wild nature Mm -hmm. so that there's this, uh, it's almost like a game. This is the way I think of it. uh, That there's almost like a game because if you go someplace and you, it looks like man has never touched it, but it has been, it means you've won in a sense. And, and, And this is very interesting because I'll tell you an anecdote. I have only been outside of London once in my life, and it was the long, long time ago, long, 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 long time ago, my first visit to Europe, and you I went to spend... didn't have the internet yet. Oh, way back. Way back. There was no internet. <laughs> Believe me, there was no internet. And, and I went to the countryside, and we went to the countryside near Cambridge, mm-hmm. which is, of course, as in many of the parts of England, uh, relatively built up. Oh, but yeah. but if you leave the actual city and walk into the fields, you you have countryside and and we were walking in fields that had wheat and of course the law in England is that you have to have a walkway for people to go through no matter how much you have private property. The law in England is that you have to have a footpath for people to cross over your property and I was with a bunch of friends and it was a summer day and we were walking through this area. I'm not sure exactly where I was, but we were walking through this area that was rolling hills with fields of wheat and there were these gigantic bosques of trees nearby. And I said, because at that time I had gone there from living in California where I was used to going into the mountains and seeing forests that had never basically been touched by humans Mm -hmm. except when they cut down the trees. And I remember saying to somebody that was English, that was with this group we were with, where I was young and we were all college students, um, gosh, this is really beautiful. This is real wild nature in England. And I will never forget it really made an impression on me. The person, I don't know who it, was, who it was, turned around and said to me, this is not wild nature. Everything you see in England has been planted by man. And I went, what are you talking about? And he said, you have to remember, England is that old. Yeah. It was occupied first by one group and then another and then another and then the Romans. And there is no place in England that has wild nature that has not been replanted by human beings. And yeah. I went, Wow. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's so very different. It's than, very, very different. So even yeah. though I was looking at what looked like nature in the sense of what Americans yeah. call nature, which is just it's out there and you haven't done anything to it, it was not, but it was created in such a way that it gives you the feeling of that. You know, you know? I don't know if there's that many places even in America anymore where y- there's really no intervention by people. I mean, you have park rangers. You, and have, you have, right. You have people like that who's, even BLM lands in the West. They cut down things. They, they manage the land. Yeah, they manage things because, you know, if a tree falls down onto a, a a dirt road, well, somebody's going to cut it down. I mean, That's you're, true. You're not going to leave but it But there's there. a difference between managing land and recreating it. Repl- in that other is words, true. The, yes. the, 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 it, what struck me as an amazing idea or concept was that every single thing there had been planted, uh, even if it was 200 years ago. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it was very, very strange. But the English don't want to feel like they have this symmetrical control. They don't want you to thing. see it right away. That is that if you have, controlled. if you go to an English cottage, which I always find very funny because they're usually these big, wonderful houses, you know, and they call it a cottage, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, an English garden, even if it's planted by somebody, it is meant to look like wildflowers growing without yeah. specifically bands that are in this uniform fashion and everything right. cut. And it's so totally different from the French and Italian 
version of what a garden is. That's a, that's a very good point. I hadn't thought that that really the French tradition came from the from the Italians, but yeah. And Le Nôtre, he was so popular that um, I was listening to a, a radio show on France France Culture mm -hmm. uh, recently about him, and they were saying that he was so popular that. Tiny towns all over France have some gardens that they said Le Nôtre designed. But, uh -huh. but what it is is he, he just – somebody brought him a drawing and he said, well, do this instead of that and right. then signed it and, and that's their Le Nôtre. I mean, he never saw it. He right. just – advised uh, people who came to seek his his uh, opinion and th they call all of those le notre gardens he was really a not. trendsetter in yeah, that sense yes, you know very he, much he very created much. the concept but i think of the you know the boboli gardens in florence and all of these other places th these the, the they say that the biggest difference between an italian park garden and a french one is that in the italian ones there is a lot of sculpture Mm -hmm. And there's more structure in the sense that it's not just the plants. So that, uh, you, you see the act of man in, in man, of human, in, in the material presence in, in the garden. That is, of course, the Luxembourg garden, um, which of course eventually was carried over again into the Tuileries, uh, whereas you have other parks in Paris that are designed on the concept of the English park or garden mm -mm. so that you turn a corner and something is different. Mm -hmm. see? So it's very interesting because certain, it depends on which century they were built in. Okay. You know, and uh, just, I just want to mention just very briefly. Yeah, we need to wrap up. The two other parks that are very beautiful in Toulouse are amazingly recent because one mm -hmm. is the park of Compans Caffarelli, yep. which was only built in the beginning of the 1980s. That's right. I remember and when they put that up. You remember when they put that up. Mm -hmm. And inside that park, which is actually a very beautiful park and is much more like an English park than mm -hmm. a French one, there is a, an imperial Japanese garden mm -hmm. that covers uh, seven hectare and is uh, a prize-winning Japanese garden. It's very nice. It's very beautiful. And then the other one, which I happen to like, but is much more of even though it's very big and airy, is more city-like city for some reason. And that is the park of Raymond VI, which is next to the Abattoir and leads on to the water of the Garonne. And that was only built uh, in that's 2000. Even, yeah, that's even more recent. It's even more recent. And there, it's really amazing having lived here and seen that it was industrial wasteland before. Yeah. Uh, on the outside, again, just like these three parks by Montrand, it butts up against the other section of the medieval walls that surrounded Toulouse. And it's, again, a space that's designed, in this case, for everybody to come and use. And it's very big and open, lovely, lovely grass and, and, and of course, some beautiful trees that planted there. And it was very consciously and specifically designed so that families could bring kids there. There's a lot of space for the kids to run around on. There's little tricycles and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's it's very beautiful and airy. And I find it very interesting that the two very recent ones, aside from the fact that they're both big, much bigger than mm -hmm, these others, mm -hmm. um, they they were really designed with the idea that there would be lots of big green grass and, and trees and space and very, very, very user-friendly. And That's they're very good. beautiful. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah, Toulouse, we, we have some nice gardens. I'm sure the gardens, well, Paris has a lot more gardens and a lot, you know, they spend more money on their gardens right. probably. But but we have, you know, it's a perfectly wonderful city to, to go on a garden tour with, with Elise, of course. With me, of course. With Elise, of course. Especially in the nice weather. <laughs> yeah, this weather has been really good. This year... We've, we've locked out. Yeah. Well, you know, it depends on the time of the year. Too. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to book a tour with Elise, you do that through uh, her Facebook page. You look up Toulouse Guided Walks and uh, you can hook up that way. And or just ask a question. Thank you so much, Elise. You are quite welcome, Annie. Merci. A bientôt. Merci. Au revoir. Au revoir. This week, I want to say thank you to Robin Harvey, who used the tip your guide button on the right hand side of joinusinfrance.com to send in a donation. Thank you very much, Robin. 
I also want to thank those of you who chose to go to joinusinfrance.com forward slash Amazon before making their Amazon purchases because it earns us a small commission that helps pay for the bandwidth for this show. This week you bought some interesting stuff, a pomegranate moisturizer, a Chinese food recipe book, which by the way, I love Chinese food, but I can't do it. Maybe I need one of those books too. A DVD about planes, love airplanes, Airbus, go Airbus, <laughs> headphones, audio cables, and a power cable for a Magellan GPS. Every little bit counts, so thank you for remembering to go to Amazon.com through joinusinfrance.com first. There will not be an episode on August 1st and on August 8th since I'll be at sea, but next week I'll bring you a trip report with some friends who spent some time in Paris and are now touring around Toulouse and it's fun to talk to them about their experiences, so I'll share those with you. Au revoir, happy vacation planning! This brings us to the end of another Join Us in France travel podcast. You can leave a comment on the website, follow us on Facebook, or look for at Paris Podcast on Twitter. I put lots of information on Facebook and Twitter that never makes it into the shows. And also, this is a subliminal message. Join the mailing list now, today. You can do that on joinusinfriends.com. Look for the green button. Et c'est tout pour aujourd'hui. Thank you.